was Dunkirk. The word was definitely Dunkirk. Here was safety. Here was the way out. This is how you'll survive. If you can make Dunkirk, you can survive. In May 1940, James Halstead was at Dunkirk, an 18-year-old private in the British Expeditionary Force. Today, he is a cook and manages an apartment house in Los Angeles. In 1940, Walter Hess was a tank commander in the German 10th Panzer Corps. Today, a design engineer, he lives in Santa Monica, California. It is a terrible thing to see a young person suddenly dead. One who only yesterday was laughing and joking and full of happiness and life. But that is war. It's today him and tomorrow me. At Dunkirk, on the northwest coast of France, the lives of James Halstead and Walter Hess came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one Englishman, one German, relive that moment in history. I'm Jim Bishop. By May 1940, Hitler has taken Austria by Anschluss, Czechoslovakia by demand, and Poland by Blitzkrieg. The world is to learn more about this word Blitzkrieg. It's Hitler's version of lightning war, an attack mounted with motorized infantry, fast-moving heavy guns and tanks, and sudden death from the sky. It brought Poland to her knees in less than four weeks. Now, in 1940, Hitler is ready to turn his blitzkrieg on the West. New targets, Holland, Belgium, France, and then across the channel to England. Before England, though, he must defeat not only the armies of the continent, but a British expeditionary force of a quarter million men stationed in France. Defeat or capture of these tough professional soldiers will mean the end of the British army and probably of England too. Hitler orders the lightning to strike. The German battle plan, called Plan Yellow, is in fact a two-pronged attack to seal off the French First Army the British Expeditionary Force, and the Belgian Army. And in one of the Panzers is tank commander Walter Hess. We are advancing fast and have very few casualties. We feel on top of the world. Everything together is like a tonic, like intoxication. I'm aware of the superiority of the German army technically as a combat unit and also in our training and morale. Soon we contact Belgian troops. The Belgians are only a little nation and we care nothing for fighting them. Only with the French and English we want to fight. The British Expeditionary Force reacts swiftly to this German invasion. Moves east to meet it the same day. One of the British soldiers is James Halstead. We're heading towards Lille and into the general area of the Albert Canal. We meet with most welcome arms. It's Vive l'Anglais. They figure you to be a savior. Of course, we are close. During the First War, we've been close for hundreds of years, and we're welcome now. The first couple of
of days in Belgium, things are all right. Your rations are pretty good. There is quite a bit of living off the land. We're living pretty well, but eventually it gets to be a bit of a stinker. Stukas and Messerschmitts. They have command of the skies. This Stuka is quite a formidable weapon. It is scary more than anything else. They've got screamers on the wing fins and on the bombs, and the sound really shakes you. after the invasion, on the 13th, Rommel, now deep into Belgium, takes his 7th Panzer Division across the River Meuse. By the 14th, Holland is crushed. Lightning has struck. Rommel is able to write, The way to the west is open. When you see the Belgian and Dutch armies get sliced up so quickly, and the French armies, and even the British expeditionary force ruined by this terrific onslaught of tanks and planes, you figure you're going to lose a battle, but not a war. You get a feeling, it is a typical British feeling that we'll bumble through somehow. The British forces, under Lord Gort, begin to fall back toward the Channel ports. What began as a small hole in the French line has widened dangerously into a 50-mile breach. Nobody for sure can say he enjoys warring. But this first encounter with the English troops is for us a satisfaction. I'm sure that this war in the West will end shortly in victory. Ten days after invasion, the German drive to the sea is complete. We reach the channel and see Dover. Most of my friends had the desire to put all the divisions in a boat and end up in England. Along with the retreating armies and the advancing armies comes still another, the Army of the Homeless. I'm in one hell of a mess. The Germans have cut me off and my way out is through them. But I decide I should travel under the guise of a nun to get out. The Germans aren't moving these peasants because they want them to hamper the roads. So good sister that I am, I hamper the roads with the rest of them. Finally, I run into a British outpost. Some lousy sergeant major throws a rifle in my hands and says, dig him with the rest of these guys and drop the disguise. With Boulogne surrounded, with Calais besieged, von Rundstedt orders his panzers to a halt. The advance is costing too much in armor. When you are two weeks between baths and you are riding on a hot panzer, you get to smell like a tiger. May 27th, von Rundstedt orders his panzers back into battle. Launches the biggest attack of the campaign.
Now we start hearing a lot about Dunkirk. By this time, the word Dunkirk has become a big word. This is where you have to be, Dunkirk. Everybody is heading for Dunkirk. It is a kind of a magnet to all. With the German pincers closing from both east and west, and with the ocean behind them, the British consider a last resort, a full-scale evacuation from the French Channel ports. On the way to Dunkirk, I served with practically every outfit in the British Army at one time or another. But that's what they're paying me for, a shilling or two shillings a day. From Dunkirk, the signal goes out to England. Evacuation tomorrow night is problematical. May 27, 1940. With the German pincers only 10 miles apart, the bulk of the British force and part of the French First Army escaped through a narrow aisle into the pocket around Dunkirk. A defense perimeter is established at the line of canals around the port city. We still have small arms, grenades, rifles, and Bren gun, and the old Vickers machine gun that was used in the First World War. Sides of the pocket, the battle to hold the perimeters around Dunkirk rages furiously. Dunkirk is held in a death grip. The fight moves from street to street. If it is to be taken, it will be taken one house at a time. for Dunkirk is no longer a battle of large armies in the field. It's a battle of small groups, desperate, trapped men. May 28th, with German leading tanks within sight of Dunkirk, they are again called to a halt. We are surprised when we are halted so suddenly. There's no explanation. The English are literally running away, throwing away their guns. Ahead of us, we see smoking and burning Dunkirk. Von Rundstedt finally orders his panzers out for good, heads them south for Paris. But the Battle of Dunkirk is far from over. Operation Dynamo is underway. But from the beginning, it seems doomed to failure. The first ship to survive the minefields, the torpedoes, and the Luftwaffe on the way across the channel now find themselves under the German guns at Calais. Once inside of Dunkirk, the big ships discover they are too big for its shallow waters. They can't get in close enough to take the men off. Only 7,000 make it out the first day. On the 29th, the ships are using a new approach to Dunkirk. They escape the shelling, only to be bombed and strafed by the Luftwaffe.
7,000 troops make it out on the 29th. Late afternoon, a signal goes out from the beaches. Dunkirk Harbor blocked by damaged ships. All evacuation must be from the beaches. But in this one day, three destroyers have been sunk, six badly damaged. The Admiralty, alarmed by the loss, suddenly orders all new class destroyers withdrawn. Without them, Operation Dynamo is in trouble. I belong to the so-called Ghost Division, a name given us by the French. We keep popping up so unexpectedly that they give us a name, the Ghost Division. On the morning of the 30th, an urgent telephone call goes to the British War Ministry. Perimeter cannot be held for long. Send as many boats and as much ammunition as possible. By May 30th, all of the British Expeditionary Force and the remnants of the French First Army are now compressed into a corner of beach 24 miles long, 6 miles wide. From across the channel, the strangest fleet in naval history begins to materialize. From the weekend yachts of the wealthy to the grimy working tugs of London, everything that can float is pressed into service. have heard the thunder of Dunkirk from Dover. Neither that nor the news of disaster holds them back. On the contrary, the naval records will show that many yachts, although warned they are too slow, start out against orders and have to be turned back by the Navy. They get in everything together, everything they can lay their hands on. And then you look out there and see what you consider to be rowboats. And this is it. This is the way you get back to England. If the day belongs to anyone, it belongs to the little boats. Frenchmen, too, thronging the beaches, Churchill orders them given an equal opportunity for evacuation. By the 31st, 200,000 men have been lifted. June 1st, in a last-ditch effort to stop the evacuation, the Germans go all out everything they have at Dunkirk. By the end of the day, 31 ships have been sunk, 11 badly damaged. The Germans are within four miles of the beach. Still the ships come. There are men yet to be saved. 
two boats and get put off for stretcher cases. The third time I make it, I'm going home on a minesweeper. We are shoved into every part of that boat except the bridge in the engine room. Every bit of space is used wherever you look, you see people. Some of the guys get lucky on the destroyers and they get fed. Cocoa, hot drinks and everything. Not that anybody really cared, we just wanted to get the hell out of there. The weather is beautiful. It's a blessing. And in England, there will be fruit on the trees. At 11.30 p.m., June 2nd, Dunkirk signals, British Expeditionary Force evacuated. At 9, the morning of June 3rd, Dunkirk surrenders. 40,000 troops, mostly French, and including the brave men of the fighting rear guard, are left behind. This is the tragedy of Dunkirk. After Dunkirk, Walter Hess moves south for the occupation of Paris, later fights in Africa where Rommel awards him the Iron Cross. James Halstead returns with his unit to Scotland for the Battle of Britain. Later, he too fights in Africa, wins the North Africa Star, and ends the war as a sergeant. Churchill reminds his countrymen and the world that wars are not won by evacuation. Still, a fighting army had been snatched from the ruins of Dunkirk by the miracle of the small boats. 338,000 men were free to fight again. This was the triumph of Dunkirk. In 1942, Gilbert Usher Renwick was a sergeant in the Queen's own Cameron Highlanders and participated in the raid on Dieppe. Today he is a police officer in Vancouver and a piper in the police band. Dieppe isn't something one wants to talk about too much. But no one can say that the fighting men who landed there weren't glorious. They were the very cream of Canada. In 1942, Heinz Casino was a corporal in the German 302nd Infantry Division, stationed outside of Dieppe. A Berliner before the war, he lives today in Passaic, New Jersey, where he works as a toolmaker. The Dieppe invasion was doomed to failure. When it happened, it was over quickly. I shall never forget the sight of those wounded Tommies, screaming with pain on the beaches, and nobody able to help them. 
On the beaches of Dieppe, the lives of Sergeant Renwick and Corporal Cassina came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one Canadian, one German, relive that moment in history. I'm Jim Bishop. There is a time, even in war, when friends fall out. This occurs among the Allies in the summer of 1942. The Russians are reeling under waves of German attack. They want a second front in Europe now. This would mean a full-scale invasion, impossible at this time. To lessen the pressure on the Russians and to test invasion problems, the Canadian, British, and American forces staged the biggest cross-channel raid of the war. The objective? A small coastal town in occupied France, Dieppe. The Germans are keenly aware that the Allies are under pressure from Russia to establish a second front. From Denmark to the south of France, the Wehrmacht has fortified the coastline to repel any invader. Wehrmacht General Konrad Haas commands the 302nd Infantry Division in the Dieppe sector. He has designed an elaborate defense, supplemented by the natural obstacles of high cliffs and inhospitable beaches. Assigned to duty with the 302nd Infantry Division along the northwestern coast of France is ex-Lufafa veteran Corporal Heinz Cassina. I have recently attended a course in demolition and anti-tank warfare. Our instructors show us how to destroy enemy panzers with telaminen and Kohlhaftlag. The first is a flat mine that you put on the ground. The second is a magnet with explosive that you can slap right on top of the panzer. There is talk of invasion. The British landings can be expected. But it is doubtful that anything will take place here at the app. Here the war seems very far away. The farmers are tilling their fields. There is a feeling of quiet and peace about the countryside. Among the thousands of Dominion troops gathered in England awaiting action is a 26-year-old platoon leader of the 2nd Canadian Division, Sergeant Gilbert Usher Renwick. We have come from all over Canada, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, British Columbia. We're just part of the troops tramping around England at this time. We're over here to do whatever is needed. April 1942, the Allies begin planning an exploratory raid on France. The port of Dieppe is selected as the target. The operation is officially described as a reconnaissance in force, an experiment of men and equipment. The purpose, to test German defensive measures and new allied assault weapons. The plan, given the code name Operation Reuter, is under the direction of Lord Louis Mountbatten. May 1942, the waiting is over. The Canadian 2nd Division is picked to carry the major part of Operation Reuter. We've been sent to the Isle of Wight for special training. We're training like hell, day and night, getting into top condition, really good fighting shape. We're assured by our officers that we're not doing this just for fun.
July 2nd, the troops move out. They will be supplemented by a few British commandos and United States Rangers. In essence, though, this is a Canadian operation. We don't know where we're going, but there's a wild buzz, a raids to be made along the French coast. The secret is out. We are told that we are going to Dieppe. I think it's with a certain relief that we learn the plans. We have trained so long, we're almost overtrained. spot the concentration of shipping and attack. Operation Router is now cancelled. A number of the Allied leaders are flatly against revival of the raid for security reasons. As thousands of troops know the plans, it is doubtful if secrecy can be maintained. Churchill favors going on. Mount Patton urges a revised raid on the condition that it can be remounted within a month. This suggestion is endorsed. The new plan, codenamed Operation Jubilee, is set for August 18th. Everyone is confined to camp. We are ready to do whatever we are told. There is no panic, no fear. The Padre holds communion, many of the boys attend. We just hope that in what lies ahead, we'll have a fighting chance. August 17th, 273 ships put out to sea, bearing over 6,100 assault troops, tanks and field guns and small arms. The main landings will be at Dieppe with flank landings at Puy and Bernval on the left, Pourville and Varangeville on the right. The four flank attacks are scheduled for 4.50 a.m. A half hour later, the major landings at Dieppe. 3.47 a.m. Only seven miles off the French coast, a portion of the Allied convoy is discovered by German naval units. of the Allied flotilla. Yet, unaware of the magnitude of the Canadian force, they report the encounter as a normal convoy incident. The Allied fleet continues on course. It is too late to turn back. 4.45 a.m. Within seven minutes, three of the flank landings are made. The encountered opposition is light. Blue and lilac colored flares. Leuchtput. They've made a landing. It's hard to believe. 5.01 a.m. The Germans sound the alarm along the entire sector. a.m. The fourth landing at Puy, to the left of Dieppe, is 15 minutes late. It is smashed on the beaches. 5.12 a.m. The Royal Navy opens fire on Dieppe. 
hurricanes and Spitfires sweep in to cover the landings. a.m. The first assault waves hit the beaches of Dieppe. They are met by murderous fire from the German snipers and machine gun emplacements. The initial bombardment has failed to subdue the enemy. The men are methodically slaughtered as enfilade fire sweeps across their defenseless positions. Within minutes, regiments are reduced to company size. 5.35 a.m. 30 tanks reach the bullet-infested beach. They become prime targets for the German artillery. 5.35 the well-placed Germans are able to drench the invaders with deadly crossfire. At Dieppe, over 2,000 men are pinned down, unable to regroup or maneuver. We have driven the Tommies back to the beaches. We are not an easy enemy. They are not cowards, but certainly they know that they will be defeated. They have no place to go but to the sea. 5.50 a.m. The Queen's own Cameron Highlanders head for Pourville, the second assault to strike these beaches. We begin to wonder about a great many things as the time draws near. But of one thing we are certain, for troops who have not been in action, we're as seasoned as troops can be. Speaking for my battalion, the Camerons, we are ready for anything. We have confidence in our officers. Most of us feel that things will come off all right, that we won't be doing anything that does not give us a good chance. There's very little fire cover, but a gunboat holds up close to us and lets go at the batteries hidden in the cliffs. Our landing craft drives right up onto the sand. We jump off into a foot of water. Other boats are right behind us. The objective is a farm further inland. From there, we're to proceed to an airfield and take it. We've run into heavy crossfire outside Pourville, but we push ahead toward our objective, the airdrome of saint Alvin. There, we're to meet up with tanks coming from Dieppe. In the air above the beaches, a significant battle is developing. 69 Allied squadrons sweep across the coast to intercept German aircraft, and also to pin down German reinforcements. flyers make 3,000 sorties, forcing the Luftwaffe to put every available plane into the air. It is the greatest display of air power since the Battle of Britain. Corville to the right, the Canadians find there is no hope in obtaining their objectives. The tanks have failed to arrive from Dieppe. They begin to withdraw to the beaches. 
The Germans are closing in. There's very heavy fighting. We throw up a rear guard action around the edge of the town. This may help more men to reach the beaches. 6.30 a.m. The force commanders are alarmed by the deteriorating situation. The vital headlands around Dieppe must be taken without delay. Reinforcements are rushed in. Yep, the attempts to break into town are met with superior forces. Gradually, the Canadians are forced back. Without tank support or adequate firepower, they are incapable of meeting the German resistance. 7 a.m. In a final attempt to gain the Dieppe headlands, the reserve forces are ordered in. A dense smoke screen is laid to cover the approach of the landing craft. emerge into a world of total destruction. The beach is swept by concentrated enemy fire. Lifespan on the beaches is now a matter of seconds. The Allied position is hopeless. The landing craft are ordered to return to sea. It seems like a very bad dream. We're trying to get out of here and we can't. It's unbelievable that we should be stuck on a beach with no place to go. The men are picked off as they run back to the landing crates. It's a terrible, terrible thing. They do not have a chance. The German fire is terrific. The boats are being shot right out of the water. Our losses are real heavy. Fighters and bombers managed to break through the Allied air umbrella. Come swiftly now. The command orders full withdrawal for 11 a.m. Very few make it back to the ships. Shortly before 1 p.m., the Canadian command ship moves in near the beaches to see if further evacuation is possible. There are no signs of life. At 1.08 p.m., a message is received from the beaches. Our people here have surrendered. I am wounded and barely conscious. It is very hard to accept the fact that it is all over. This is not the way things had been planned. There is one thing I remember as I'm taken prisoner. The lines a Cockney used to recite. And when the war is done and youth stone dead, 
I'll toddle safely home and die in bed. At Dieppe, nearly 2,000 Canadians are taken prisoner, many of them seriously wounded. The ones who can walk are marched to the railroad station. When I look at the beach, I feel sick to my stomach. Soldiers are lying about uh, with their half their body shot away, their limbs gone. And as I look at them, all the heroism of war becomes nothing. The beach below has become a gruesome battlefield. Operation Jubilee is over. The Dieppe raid lasted only eight hours. Of the 6,100 men landed, 4,600 are either dead, wounded, or prisoners. The Canadians alone sacrificed 3,300 men from its second division. The German losses, 600 soldiers. Sergeant Renwick, wounded on the beaches and captured by the Germans, will later escape from a prisoner of war camp and return to England. Corporal Cassino later will fight at Monte Cassino, at Normandy, and in the Ardennes, where the Americans take him prisoner in 1944. On the military side, Dieppe is a stinging defeat for the Allies, a stunning victory for the Germans. But the raids caused the Germans to reinforce the West and tie up 45 divisions and 1,500 planes, all needed for the Russian campaigns. Through the lessons of the raid, the Allies developed new landing techniques, new equipment, and new respect for German firepower.